We're on Mark 6. Soon afterward, he left that section of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath, he went to the synagogue to teach, and the people were astonished at his wisdom and his miracles because he was just a local man like themselves. He's no better than we are, they said. He's just a carpenter, Mary's boy, and a brother of James and Joseph. Judas and Simon and his sisters live right here among us, and they were offended. Then Jesus told them, A prophet is honored everywhere except in his hometown and among his relatives and by his own family, and because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any mighty miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them, and he could hardly accept the fact that they wouldn't believe in him. Then he went on among the villages teaching, and he called his twelve disciples together and sent them out two by two with power to cast out demons. He told them to take nothing with them except their walking sticks, no food, no knapsack, no money, not even an extra pair of shoes or change of clothes. Stay at one home in each village. Don't shift around from house to house while you're there, he said. And whenever a village won't accept you or won't listen to you, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave. It is a sign that you have abandoned it to its fate. So the disciples went out, telling everyone they met to turn from sin, and they cast out many demons and healed many sick people, anointing them with olive oil. King Herod soon heard about Jesus, for his miracles were talked about everywhere. The king thought Jesus was John the Baptist, but came to life again. So the people were saying, no wonder he can do such miracles. Others thought Jesus was Elijah, the ancient prophet, now returned to life again. Still others claimed he was a new prophet, like the great ones of the past. No, Herod said, it is John, the man I beheaded. He has come back from the dead. For Herod had sent soldiers to arrest and imprison John, because he kept saying it was wrong for the king to marry Her Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Herodias wanted John killed in revenge, but without Herod's approval, she was powerless. And Herod respected John, knowing that he was a good and holy man, so he kept him under his protection. Herod was disturbed whenever he talked with John, but even so he listened to him. He liked to listen to him. Herodias' chance finally came. It was Herod's birthday, and he gave a stag party for his palace aides, army officers, and the leading citizens of Galilee. Then Herodias' daughter came in and danced before them, and greatly pleased them all. Ask me for anything you like, the king vowed, even half of my kingdom, and I will give it to you. She went out and consulted her mother, who told her, Ask for John the Baptist's head. So she hurried back to the king and told him, I want the head of John the Baptist right now, on a tray. Then the king was sorry, but he was embarrassed to break his oath in front of his guests. So he sent one of his bodyguards to the prison to cut off John's head and bring it to him. The soldier killed John in the prison, brought back his head on a tray, and gave it to the girl, and she took it to her mother. When John's disciples heard what had happened, they came for his body and buried it in a tomb. The apostles now returned to Jesus from their tour and told him all they had done and what they had said to the people they visited. Then Jesus suggested, let's go away from the crowds for a while and rest, for so many people were coming and going that they scarcely had time to eat. So they left by boat for a quieter spot. But many people saw them leaving and ran on ahead along the shore and met them as they landed. So the usual vast crowd was there as he stepped from the boat and he had pity on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd and he taught them many things they needed to know. Late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, Tell the people to go away to the nearby villages and farms, and buy themselves some food, for there is nothing to eat here in this desolate spot, and it's getting late. But Jesus said, You feed them. With what, they asked, it would take a fortune to buy food for all this crowd. How much food do we have? he asked. Go and find out. They came back to report that there were five loaves of bread and two fish. Then Jesus told the crowd to sit down, and soon colorful groups of fifty 
or a hundred each were sitting on a green grass. He took the five loaves and two fish, and looking up to heaven gave thanks for the food. Breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave some of the bread and fish to each disciple to place before the people, and the crowd ate until they could hold no more. There were about 5,000 men there for that meal, and afterwards 12 basketfuls of scraps were packed up off the grass. Immediately after this, Jesus instructed his disciples to get back into the boat and strike out across the lake to Bethsaida, where he would join them later. He himself would stay and tell the crowds goodbye and get them started home. Afterwards, he went up into the hills to pray. During the night, as the disciples in their boat were out in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land, he saw that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and waves. About three o'clock in the morning, he walked out to them on the water. He started past them, but when they saw something walking along beside them, they screamed in terror, thinking it was a ghost, for they all saw him. But he spoke to them at once. It's all right, he said. It is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat, and the wind stopped. They just sat there, unable to take it in, for they still didn't realize who he was, even after the miracle the evening before, for they didn't want to believe. When they arrived at Gennesaret on the other side of the lake, they moored the boat and climbed out. The people standing around there recognized him at once and ran throughout the whole area to spread the news of his arrival and began carrying sick folks to him on mats and stretchers. Wherever he went in villages and cities and out on the farms, they laid the sick in the market plazas and streets and begged him to let them at least touch the fringes of his clothes, and as many as touched him were healed. One day, some religious, Jewish religious leaders arrived from Jerusalem to investigate him and noticed that some of his disciples failed to follow the usual Jewish rituals before eating, for the Jews, especially the Pharisees, will never eat until they have sprinkled their arms to the elbows, as required by their ancient traditions. So when they come home from the market, they must always sprinkle themselves in this way before touching any food. This is but one of many examples of laws and regulations they have clung to for centuries and still follow, such as their ceremony of cleansing for pots, pans, and dishes. So the religious leaders ask him, why don't your disciples follow our age-old customs, for they eat without first performing the washing ceremony? Jesus replied, You bunch of hypocrites! Isaiah the prophet described you very well when he said, These people speak very pettily about the Lord, but they have no love for him at all. Their worship is a farce, for they claim that God commands the people to obey their petty rules. How right Isaiah was! For you ignore God's specific orders and substitute your own traditions. You are simply rejecting God's laws and trampling them under your feet for the sake of tradition. For instance, Moses gave you this law from God, Honor your father and mother, and he said that anyone who speaks against his father or mother must die. But you say it is perfectly all right for a man to disregard his needy parents, telling them, Sorry, I can't help you. For I have given to God what I could have given to you, and so you break the law of God in order to protect your man-made tradition. And this is only one example. There are many, many others. Then Jesus called to the crowd to come and hear. All of you listen, he said, and try to understand. Your souls aren't harmed by what you eat, but by what you think and say. Then he went into the house to get away from the crowds, and his disciples asked him what he meant by the statement he had just made. Don't you understand either, he asked. Can't you see that what you eat won't harm your soul? For food doesn't come in contact with your heart, but only passes through the digestive system. By saying this, he showed that every kind of food is kosher. And then he added, It is the thought life that pollutes. For from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts of lust, theft, murder, adultery, wanting what belongs to others, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, pride, and all other folly. All these vile things come from within. They are what pollute you and make you unfit for God. Then he left Galilee and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon and tried 
to keep it a secret that he was there but couldn't. For as usual, the news of his arrival spread fast. Right away a woman came to him whose little girl was possessed by a demon. She had heard about Jesus, and now she came and fell at his feet and pled with him to release her child from the demon's control. But she was Syrophonican, a despised Gentile. Syrophonician is how you pronounce that, a despised Gentile. Jesus told her, first, I should help my own family, the Jews. It isn't right to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She replied, that's true, sir, but even the puppies under the table are given some scraps from the children's plates. Good, he said, you have answered well, so well, that I have healed your little girl. Go on home, for the demon has left her. And when she arrived home, her little girl was lying quietly in bed, and the demon was gone. From Tyre he went to Sidon, then back to the Sea of Galilee, by way of the ten towns. And a deaf man with a... I'm having trouble turning the page. One second. A deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him, and everyone begged Jesus to lay his hands on the man and heal him. Jesus led him away from the crowd and put his fingers into the man's ears, then spat and touched the man's tongue with the spittle. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and commanded, Open! Instantly the man could hear perfectly and speak plainly. Jesus told the crowd not to spread the news, but the more he forbade them, the more they made it known, for they were overcome with utter amazement. Again and again they said, everything he does is wonderful. He even corrects deafness and stammering. One day about this time, as another great crowd gathered, the people ran out of food again. Jesus called his disciples to discuss the situation. I pity these people, he said, for they have been here three days and have nothing left to eat. And if I send them home without feeding them, they will faint along the road for some of them have come a long distance. Are we supposed to find food for them here in the desert? His disciples scoffed. How many leaves, loaves of bread do you have? He asked. Seven, they replied. So he told the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves, thanked God for them, broke them into pieces, and passed them to his disciples. And the disciples placed them before the people. A few small fish were found too, so... Jesus also blessed these and told the disciples to serve them. And the whole crowd ate until they were full, and afterwards he sent them home. There were about 4,000 people in the crowd that day, and when the scraps were picked up after the meal, there were seven very large basketfuls left over. Immediately after this, he got into a boat with his disciples and came to the region of Damanutha. When the local Jewish leaders learned of his arrival, they came to argue with him. Do a miracle for us, they said. Make something happen in the sky. Then we will believe in you. He sighed deeply when he heard this and said, Certainly not. How many more miracles do you people need? So he got back into his boat and left them and crossed to the other side of the lake. But the disciples had forgotten to stock up on food before they left and had only one loaf of bread in the boat. As they were crossing, Jesus said to them very solemnly, Beware of the yeast of King Herod and of the Pharisees. What does that mean? The disciples asked each other. They finally decided that he must be talking about their forgetting to bring bread. Jesus realized what they were discussing and said, No, that isn't it at all. Can't you understand? Are your hearts too hard to take it in? Your eyes are to see with. Why not look? Why don't you open your ears and listen? Don't you remember anything at all? What about the 5,000 men I fed with five loaves of bread? How many basketfuls of scraps did you pick up afterwards? Twelve, they said. And when I fed the 4,000 with seven loaves, how much was left? Seven basketfuls, they said. And yet you think I'm worried that we have no bread? When they arrived at Bethsaida, some people brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch and heal him. Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village, and spat upon his eyes, and laid his hands over them. Can you see anything now? Jesus asked him. The man looked around. Yes, he said. 
I see men, but I can't see them very clearly. They look like tree trunks walking around. Then Jesus placed his hands over the man's eyes again, and as the man stared intently, his sight was completely restored, and he saw everything clearly, drinking in the sights around him. Jesus sent him home to his family. Don't even go back to the village first, he said. Jesus and his disciples now left Galilee and went out to the villages of Caesarea, Philippi. As they were walking along, he asked them, Who do the people think I am? What are they saying about me? Some of them think you are John the Baptist, the disciples replied, and others say you are Elijah or some other ancient prophet come back to life again. Then he said, Who do you think I am? Peter replied, You are the Messiah. But Jesus warned them not to tell anyone. Then he began to tell them about the terrible things he would suffer, and that he would be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the other Jewish leaders and be killed, and that he would rise again three days afterwards. He talked about it quite frankly with them, so Peter took him aside and chided him. You shouldn't say things like that, he told Jesus. Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, and then he said to Peter very sternly, Satan, get behind me. You are looking at this only from a human point of view and not from God's. Then he called his disciples and the crowds to come over and listen. If any of you wants to be my follower, he told them, you must put aside your own pleasures and shoulder your cross and follow me closely. If you insist on saving your life, you will lose it. Only those who throw away their lives for my sake and for the sake of the good news will ever know what it means to really live. And how does a man benefit if he gains the whole world and loses his soul in the process? For is anything worth more than his soul and anyone who is ashamed of me and my message in these days of unbelief and sin? I, the Messiah, will be ashamed of him when I return in the glory of my Father with the holy angels. Jesus went on to say to his disciples, Some of you who are standing here right now will live to see the kingdom of God arrive in great power. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John to the top of a mountain. No one else was there. Suddenly his face began to shine with glory, and his clothing became dazzling white far more glorious than any earthly process could ever make it. Then Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. Teacher, this is wonderful, Peter exclaimed. We will make three shelters here, one for each of you. He said this just to be talking, for he didn't know what else to say, and they were all terribly frightened. But while he was still speaking these words, a cloud covered them, blotting out the sun, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Then suddenly they looked around and Moses and Elijah were gone, and only Jesus was with them. As they descended the mountainside, he told them never to mention what they had seen until after he had risen from the dead. So they kept it to themselves, but often talked about it and wondered what he meant by rising from the dead. Now they began asking him about something the Jewish religious leaders often spoke of, that Elijah must return before the Messiah could come. Jesus agreed that Elijah must come first and prepare the way, and that he had, in fact, already come, and that he had been terribly mistreated, just as the prophets had predicted. Then Jesus asked them what the prophets could have been talking about and when they predicted that the Messiah would suffer and be treated with utter contempt. At the bottom of the mountain, they found a great crowd surrounding the other nine disciples as some Jewish leaders argued with them. The crowd watched Jesus in awe as he came towards them and then ran to greet him. What's all the argument about? he asked. One of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, Teacher, I brought my son for you to heal. He can't talk because he's possessed by a demon. And whenever the demon is in control of him, it dashes him to the ground, makes him foam at the mouth and grind his teeth and become rigid. So I begged your disciples to cast out the demon, but they couldn't do it. Jesus said to his disciples, Oh, what tiny faith you have! How much longer 
must I be with you until you believe? How much longer must I be patient with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy, but when he saw Jesus, the demon convulsed the child horribly, and he fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been this way? Jesus asked the father. And he replied, Since he was very small, and the demon often makes him fall into the fire or into water to kill him, or have mercy on us and do something if you can. If I can, Jesus asked, anything is possible if you have faith. The father instantly replied, I do have faith. Oh, help me to have more. When Jesus saw the crowd was growing, he rebuked the demon. O oh, demon of deafness and dumbness, he said, I command you to come out of this child and enter him no more. Then the demon screamed terribly and convulsed the boy again and left him. And the boy lay there, limp and motionless, to all appearance dead. A murmur ran through the crowd. He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet, and he stood up and was all right. Afterwards, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, Why couldn't we cast the demon out? Jesus replied, Cases like this require prayer. Leaving that region, they traveled through Galilee, where they tried to avoid all publicity in order to spend more time with his disciples, teaching them. He would say to them, I, the Messiah, am going to be betrayed and killed, and three days later I will return to life again. But they didn't understand and were afraid to ask him what he meant. And so they arrived at Capernaum. When they were settled in the house where they were to stay, he asked them, What were you discussing out on the road? But they were ashamed to answer, for they had been arguing about which of them was the greatest. He sat down and called them around him and said, Anyone wanting to be the greatest must be the least, the servant of all. Then he placed a little child among them, and taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Anyone who welcomes a little child like this in my name is welcoming me, and anyone who welcomes me is welcoming my Father who sent me. One of his disciples, John, told him one day, Teacher, we saw a man using your name to cast out demons, but we told him not to, for he isn't one of our group. Don't for bid him, Jesus said, for no one doing miracles in my name will quickly turn against me. Anyone who isn't against us is for us. If anyone so much as gives you a cup of water because you are Christ's, I say this solemnly, he won't lose his reward. But if someone causes one of these little ones who believes in me to lose faith, it would be better for that man if a huge millstone were tied around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand does wrong, cut it off. Better live forever with one hand than be thrown into the unquenchable fires of hell with two. If your foot carries you towards evil, cut it off. Better be lame and live forever than have two feet that carry you to hell. And if your eye is sinful, gouge it out. Better enter the kingdom of God half blind than have two eyes and see the fires of hell, where the worm never dies and the fire never goes out, where all are salted with fire. Good salt is worthless if it loses its saltiness. It can't season everything, anything. So don't lose your flavor. Live in peace with each other. Then he left Capernaum and went southward to the Judean borders and into the area east of the Jordan River. And as always, there were the crowds and the usual he taught them, as usual. Some Pharisees came and asked him, do you permit divorce? Of course they were trying to trap him. What did Mo Mo Moses say about divorce? Jesus asked them. He said it was all right, they replied. He said that all a man has to do is write his wife a letter of dismissal. And why did he say that? Jesus asked. I'll tell you why. It was a concession to your hard-hearted wickedness, but it certainly isn't God's way. For from the very first he made man a woman, man and woman, to be joined together permanently in marriage. Therefore a man is to leave his father and mother, and he and his wife are united, so that they are no longer two but one, and no man may separate what God has joined together. Later, when he was alone with his disciples in the house, they brought up the subject again. He told them, When a man divorces his wife to marry someone else, he commits adultery against her, and if a wife divorces her husband and remarries, she too commits adultery. 
Once, when some mothers were bringing their children to Jesus to bless them, the disciples shooed them away, telling them not to bother him. But when Jesus saw what was happening, he was very much displeased with his disciples and said to them, Let the children come to me, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as they. Don't send them away. I tell you as seriously as I know how, that anyone who refuses to come to God as a little child will never be allowed into his kingdom. Then he took the children into his arms and placed his hands on their heads, and he blessed them. As he was starting out on the trip, a man came running to him and knelt down and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to get to heaven? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. But as for your question, you know the commandments, don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat, respect your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I've never once broken a single one of those laws. Jesus felt genuine love for this man as he looked at him. You lack only one thing, he told him. Go and sell all you have and give your money to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Then the man's face fell, and he went sadly away, for he was very rich. Jesus watched him go, then turned around and said to his disciples, It's almost impossible for the rich to get into the kingdom of God. This amazed them, so Jesus said it again, Dear children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were incredulous. Then who in the world can be saved if not a rich man, they asked. Jesus looked at them intently, then said, Without God it is utterly impossible, but with God everything is possible. Then Peter began to mention all that he and the other disciples had left behind. We've given up everything to follow you, he said. And Jesus replied, Let me assure you that no one has ever given up anything, home, brothers, sisters, mother, father, children, or property, for love of me and to tell others the good news, who won't be given back a hundred times over, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and land, with persecutions. All these will be his here on earth, and in the world to come he shall have eternal life. But many people who seem to be important now will be the least important then, and many who are considered least here shall be greatest there. Now they were on the way to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking along ahead, and as the disciples were following, they were filled with terror and dread. Taking them aside, Jesus once more began describing all that was going to happen to him when they arrived in Jerusalem. When we get there, he told them, I, the Messiah, will be arrested and taken before the chief priests and the Jewish leaders who will sentence me to die and hand me over to the Romans to be killed. They will mock me and spit on me and flog me with their whips and kill me. But after three days I will come back to life again. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came over and spoke to him in a low voice. Master, they said, we want you to do us a favor. What is it, he asked. We want to sit on the thrones next to yours in the kingdom. They said, one at your right and the other at your left. But Jesus answered, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of sorrow I must drink from? or to be baptized with the baptism of suffering I must be baptized with? Oh, yes, they said, we are. And Jesus said, You shall indeed drink from my cup and be baptized with my baptism, but I do not have the right to place you on thrones next to mine. Those appointments have already been made. When the other disciples discovered what James and John had asked, they were very indignant. So Jesus called them to him and said, as you know, the kings and great men of the earth lord it over the people, but among you it is different. Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be greatest of all must be the slave of all. For even I, the Messiah, am not here to be served, but to help others and to give my life as a ransom for many. And so they reached Jericho. Later as they left town, a great crowd was following. Now it happened that a blind beggar named Bartimi Bartimaeus, uh, the son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road as Jesus was going by. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus from Nazareth was near, 
he began to shout out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Shut up, some of the people yelled at him, but he only shouted the louder, again and again, O son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped there in the road and said, Tell him to come here. So they called the blind man. You lucky fellow, they said. Come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus yanked off his old coat and flung it aside, jumped up and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. O oh, teacher, the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, All right, it's done. Your faith has healed you. And instantly the blind man could see and follow Jesus down the road. That is the end of my reading today. God bless you.